Welcome to Forensic Friday, where I tell you one true crime case that was solved using forensic science all while doing, and that's right, my makeup. But before we get started, I just wanted to say a big congratulations to the queen of murder, mystery, and makeup Monday. Shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out. Sha. I had to do it. I'm sorry. I just, every time I think of her, I have to just do her theme song. I'm so sorry. Bailey Sarian for her interview on the Kelly Clarkson show. I can't even speak because I'm so excited. I'm so excited for her. For her interview on the Kelly Clarkson show. If you guys haven't seen it, go and see it. For a small true crime and makeup content creator like me, this was so inspirational to see. I've been doing true crime videos on this channel for a while and Bailey has has been a huge inspiration for the Forensic Friday episodes, the one that you're watching today. So um, yeah, I just wanted to say a huge congratulations. The true crime and makeup community has been growing a lot since Bailey has started it. And I'm just excited to see our queen up there, Mama Bailey, doing her thing. And it just inspires me so much to keep going and to keep creating this type of content. Today's video will be featuring the BH Cosmetics 80s Remix Dance Pal. Whoa, I'm sorry about that, guys. Today's video will be featuring the BH Cosmetics 80s Dance Remix Palette, you guys obsession 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 the name of the shadows in these palettes are all 80s songs i also picked up the other two palettes that they released i got the 90s dance remix palette and the 2000s remix palette the other items i'm using in this video will be linked in the description below please read the disclaimer i am in no way shape or form a professional makeup artist beauty guru forensic pathologist scientist nothing i'm nothing i'm yet nothing no i'm just the average girl at home like you planning makeup and talking about true crime so if you love true crime and makeup be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of my future episodes and let's get into today's case this story takes place in central pennsylvania in 1984. On a Sunday morning, a fisherman was walking around enjoying the Juniata River. I think that's how you pronounce it, Juniata. I don't think, I think that. Don't kill me, guys, don't kill me. This fisherman was just, you know, walking down the trail, enjoying his day, when he saw a large cardboard box near the edge of the river. Curious, as any of us would, except for me, my ass is not that curious. Curious, he looked inside of the box and found that there was a large garbage bag. When he pulled back one of the pieces of plastic from the garbage bag, that is when he discovered a human torso. That's right, you guys, a human torso. Just your traditional stroll in the park finding human torsos. The torso he discovered was later identified as female. Investigators couldn't find any evidence indicating how the torso had gotten there in the first place. Now above the box on the side of the hill, the grass and underbrush seemed to be like stumped over or, well, it was like laying flat. You know how when you walk on nice grass, because I know this because I used to walk on my grandma's grass and she used to scream at me all the time. You know how when you, uh, you know, you step on grass and it usually leaves that indent in the grass it was flat indicating that the box had rolled down from the main road police noticed that the box had been slid down the hill after the dew had settled this was a huge piece of information in trying to determine a timeline for when this all occurred investigators noticed a grease stain puncture in the side of the box and in the grease was a small piece of styrofoam. Obviously, someone had gone through some extraordinary links to conceal the victim's identity because he had to remove the head, the arms, and the legs. So, homeboy wasn't playing. He was not playing. He was like, nah, y'all not catching me today. I just removed the whole damn head, the arms, and the legs. So he really did not want to get caught. So obviously in order to do all of that, he would need, you know, the time and the privacy, like a spot where he could do it. So one investigator thought that, you know, this was really 
interesting the way that it was done because he felt like obviously if this person dismembered an entire body and he removed all of the legs all of the legs all two of his legs he only they she only had two legs all both of the legs if they were able to get rid of the arms and the legs and the head then why would they leave the torso out there by itself there had to be some reason he thought of why they would want that torso to be discovered. Now, the body had three large moles and a scar on the abdomen area. There were jeans and a belt buckle with the Scorpio Zodiac sign on it. This was all that was left behind. This was all of the evidence investigators had to identify who the victim actually was, and that's not a lot. Now, at the autopsy, the pathologist found something very, very strange. They found evidence of like some insect activity. So they sent it to a forensic entomologist. I hope that's how you say it, Entomolo entomologist. Is my boobs coming out? I feel like my boobs are coming out, and they absolutely are. Now, an entomologist is an expert in the study of insects. So they study insects, they study bugs for life. That's what they do, guys. I almost feel like that's kind of cool. Or is it just me? I don't know. I like weird things, guys. What can I say? But I do feel like that's kind of cool. He identified it as eggs from a blue bottle fly, as well as the black blow fly, which I guess is pretty common around the United States, um, especially in this area of Pennsylvania. The development state of the larvae and egg along with the weather conditions that the body had endured allow the entomologist to come up with a rough estimate for the time of death. They found that it was about two days prior to them finding the torso. So this meant that the victim had died late Friday night or early Saturday morning, but they still didn't know the cause of death. The autopsy report was not able to identify. So at this point, investigators don't know who she is. They don't know how she died and how her torso got where to where it was. You guys see, this is the this is the reason why I'm so afraid to take the trash out at night because like. There are two garbage bags, you guys, that have been sitting behind like the main bin in my garage. I'm sorry, side note, side story. I don't know how it got there, but it's been sitting there for maybe like two weeks and the trash guys haven't even picked the bag up. And I'm, I keep like, I don't know, I keep debating if I should just pick the trash up and put it in the trash cans, which I've often done because sometimes my neighbors, if the can is full, they'll put the trash on the side, you know? And, but this has just been sitting there and it's like hidden kind of behind the main trash cans in my garage. I've just been debating whether or not I should go and put it in the trash cans. But every time I see them, I'm like, no, I'm not gonna do that. Like, uh -uh. I'm not trying to discover no dead bodies. And then I run upstairs. I quickly throw my trash in the trash can and I just run upstairs. Anyway, back to the story because you guys do not want to hear about my freaking trash. They also found semen present um, while doing the autopsy report, but, but there were no signs of rape and there was no way to identify the man. They couldn't do it because this was way before DNA testing. This was in 1984 and they did not have that sort of technology at the time. So at this point, investigators had to figure out who the victim was. They needed to identify that body. So because there was no DNA testing at this time in order to figure out who had done this, they would need to first identify the body. So the first thing police did was check their missing persons database, but no one fit the description of the missing torso. Missing torso? How was it missing? It wasn't missing, it was there. It was definitely there. Actually the head, the legs, and the arms were missing not the torso. So seven months later, they decided to go ahead and bury her. They buried the torso um, in an unmarked grave. She pretty much became a Jane Doe and forgotten because there was no identification to her. No one knew who she was. 
But just one year later, police received a routine police call. A woman told police that her ex-sister-in-law, Edna Posey, she said her sister-in-law had been missing for a year and she was able to give police a physical description of Edna. Now, something that this woman said really stood out to police. She told them that her sister-in-law, Edna, would often complain that she couldn't wear a bikini because of all of the moles that she had. That would fit the physical description of the torso that they found. So yeah, it was one on her mid back and on her right chest and on her torso. And these moles were very pigmented. The caller also said that Edna Posey always wore a belt with her zodiac buckle on it. Edna Posey was a 31 year old single mother. She had one son, he was 11 years old. According to friends, family members, and just pretty much associates really, um, they described her as someone who was always going out to the bars. She had multiple sexual relationships with different men on different occasions and she was a fast girl she was a fast girl what can we say well i'll just come out and say it they called her a tramp okay uh, i mean guys this was 1984 so any woman who wasn't with one guy and married was considered a tramp but in today's time period she would be considered a boss at the time or no she might still be considered a tramp but you know to each his own so according to them, she was always in, you know, unstable relationships and short term relationships. She also had a lot of issues with alcohol. She would abuse alcohol a lot. And she also didn't have a stable living environment for her 11 year old son, Randy. Um, but she would meet these men in bars and she would quickly move in with them and then just as quickly end up moving out. She would keep repeating this same pattern of behavior and they just thought that it really was not healthy for her son whatsoever and I'd have to agree that's really, really unhealthy. Um, I mean, if you're a single girl, do your thing, but when you have a son, a child, that's a lot of responsibility, that's another human life. Um, you can't be doing that shit, bro. Long story short. They also said that on occasion she would disappear for months at a time without saying anything to anyone. No one knew where she was or what she was doing. So according to Randy's Boy Scout troop leader, Edna had confessed to him that her life was out of control and it was an unhealthy environment for her son. And she kind of came to him to ask him for help, you know. Now, Donald, that was the name of the um, Boy Scouts troop leader. Donald, he had a reputation for taking young boys in and helping them out, particularly troubled young men or young men that were in troubling circumstances. He always would take them in and help them out and he kind of formed his own group in, within the Boy Scouts. So Randy did move in with Donald and his wife and live with them as though he was their own son. I mean, they really treated this kid just like one of their own. So 42 year old Donald was a machinist. Um, he had no children of his own, so it was just he and his wife. Now, a lot of people um, really liked Donald and they applauded him for his, you know, his efforts in helping young troubled children. A lot of other people though questioned his motives, him being, you know, a 42 year old man and, you know, being around children like that being his passion but not having any children of his own. Now it's time to go into the palettes. Seeing how this is an 80s palette, I want to create a very 80s look. I'm talking Gem and the Holograms. And girl, if you don't know who Gem and the Holograms is, you better get your life or just search it on Google. You can also do that. <laughs> but anyway, 
back to the story. Apparently, some people thought Mr. Donald was being a really creepy weirdo guy. Uh, according to one investigator, he had witnessed Donald kissing one of the boys on the mouth. And he thought it was unusual because even with his own children, he would never kiss you know a child on the mouth so he just thought that this was so incredibly weird and i'd have to agree with that investigator that's freaking weird as f so i'm gonna try to recreate this makeup look that i saw on pinterest edna was trying to get her life back on track so you know she decided to move to virginia about 150 miles away where she took a job as a dental technician while doing their investigation, they were able to speak with one of Edna's uh, friends and I think she was, I don't know if she was a co-worker, I don't know how they knew each other, but it was one of Edna's really close friends and according to her, Edna had met a guy that was in the military. They were pretty serious about each other and they were planning to move in together and to bring Randy down there with them. Oh girl, all I need is a lightning bolt and I am Jim. Okay, I am a Jim or the black girl that's in the holograms group. You see guys, that is why I always keep these things from palettes because they come real in handy. Anyway, back to what I was saying. Because she was planning to take her son back, police felt that this gave Donald a motive to possibly want to get rid of her. Police speculated that Donald may have been threatened by this. Investigators really believed and argued actually that Donald did not want to give up Randy as his son. So could this possibly have been a motive? Uh, ooh. Donald had told police that Edna came to him and his wife's home on Friday night and was planning to stay for the entire Memorial Day weekend. Donald told police that the next day he and his wife took Edna downtown to go shopping. So they picked a spot where they would meet back up with her, but when they went to go um, pick her up, she never showed up. And you know, considering you know, the type of lifestyle she had and how she was, they thought, you know, maybe she had taken off with some guy or like, who knows what she was doing? They weren't really sure. But when investigators questioned Edna's son, Randy, he told them a completely different story. He said that he had last seen his mother on Friday night when she kissed him goodnight and went to bed. Somebody lying now. Just a little bit after that, he says that he heard a very loud noise coming from the bedroom where his mother had been sleeping. According to him, it sounded like someone had fallen out of bed and when he woke up the next day, his mother was gone. Assuming the forensic entomologist, whoa, something's in here flying. Oh my God. Do you guys see that? flew straight towards my face. Assuming the forensic entomologist was right with the estimate for the time of death, Randy quite possibly could have been listening to his mother's murder. So investigators went back to Donald Ruby's place and they, you know, did a full search. And while they were searching Donald Ruby's car, they found the same grease in his trunk that they found on the box that Edna's torso was found in. And they found that the hole in the box was the same size and shape as the trunk latch found in Donald Ruby's car. Mustard. Investigators now believe that Donald Ruby murdered Edna on Friday night. So they charged Ronald with Edna's murder after they had charged Ronald with Edna's murder, they got some really unsettling news regarding Edna's son, Randy and Donald. Trigger warning here, what I'm about to say next 
is very, very disturbing and it does involve a child. For some of you, this is probably going to be a really sensitive topic. I would just um, skip past this part like two or three like seconds. Unfortunately, it does involve some really disgusting things being done to um, a young child. So I do apologize, but it is part of the case, so I must discuss it. So according to Randy, according to Randy, when they would get home from their camping trips, Donald would touch Randy on his private parts, claiming that he was checking for ticks. I just like, what the hell, what the hell, and what the hell. What a Chester Hester the child you know what. <laughs> what a creepy weirdo freak guy this guy was. Like, a, and this is a very sensitive topic for me as well, so I feel you out there. Police found direct evidence of some child pedophilia going on. Oh no. Oh no, oh no, 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 no. Okay, how do we wanna do this? Do we wanna start effing things up now or should we wait till later? Um, I'm gonna go with now. Let's just, let's just go for it. So allegedly he would examine, like I said, all of Randy's private areas. He would also, um, examine near the buttocks, like the butt hole area. He would spend a little bit more time examining more than any parent should or would. Prosecutors thought that this was a definitely um, evidence of pedophilia. They didn't like it at all and they were pretty much like, no, nah, this is Nah, buddy boy, you ain't going nowhere, Chester Hester. This is definitely pedophilia, and you're not going to get away with that ish. At this point, they felt that he was fixated on Randy, like he was obsessed with Randy sexually, and that is the reason why he did not want to return him to his mother because he just couldn't go without his nasty little fix. Nasty, nasty, nasty. Please believe that this is the reason why Donald murdered Edna and they convicted him of Edna's murder and he was sentenced to life in prison. The grease and styrofoam that was found on the box containing um, Edna's torso was enough circumstantial evidence for prosecutors to go ahead and convict him of Edna's murder. Ooh, okay, I know some of you real makeup people out there are like laughing right now, but it's not funny because I'm, I'm legit lost. Now, three years after Edna's murder, thanks to forensic science, three years after Edna's murder, Donald Ruby was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. But behind bars, Donald kept maintaining his innocence, saying that he did not murder Edna. So he said that, you know, it wasn't him pretty much and that any one of her lovers or people that she was associated with on the street could have done it. So his lawyers petitioned the court for a retrial. Damn it, if this man gets out. The defense claimed that there was no proof that Donald was a pedophile. Just, you know, the, the usual sniffing around your child's butthole and his penis area. That's about it, you know, just checking out his privates for ticks after camping, that's all. Nothing weird about it. No, not at all. Detective Inspector Lucy has just joined us. <laughs> She's tired. Not only did they say that, you know, there was no evidence that he was an actual pedophile, 
They also said that his rights had been violated when the jury heard this testimony because there was no real proof. His defense also asked to have the forensic evidence re-examined. So they brought in another forensic entomologist. This forensic entomologist was like one of the country's leading entomologists. He was like the best in the best, like dude knew his crap, okay? He knew his stuff um, and he was super popular. So the new forensic entomologist came in and re-examined the eggs and larvae found on Edna Posey's body. Flies lay eggs that turn into larvae that produce more flies. But when going over the previous autopsy report, the forensic entomologist found some inconsistencies. The medical examiner said he found eggs, but no larvae. He also found something else. The original report stated that the eggs were scraped from the victim's body and placed into a petri dish. These scrapes also contained bits and pieces of flesh and blood. Now this told the forensic entomologist that the eggs had an additional three days to feed on the flesh and develop before they were analyzed. The forensic anthropologist did test and studies and analyze the eggs and larvae found on Edna Posey's body. According to him, they were so dry that they were almost dust. So he then had to place them into a saline solution to rehydrate them. The entomologists believed that the eggs were on Edna Posey's body, but that they were on Edna Posey's body late Saturday night into early Sunday morning. That meant that she had been killed on late Saturday night or early Sunday morning, not Friday evening like the original entomologist had stated. So. There was some discrepancies in the case. Oh my God, they really messed up with that because once that mistake happened, I mean, it's kind of hard for the jury to um, find that any of the findings from that original entomologist credible because of that mistake. <gasps> I've never worn a color this bright, so it's really scary. She makes Damn. So the... That's Detective Inspector Lucy running around like that. The forensic entomologist believed that the eggs were on Edna Posey's body just for a short period of time. The meteorological evidence also pointed to the time of death being early Sunday morning as well. Investigators went back to, to question the fisherman who had found the box in the beginning. And he said that when he found the box, there was no dew or condensation on the box at all, which had traveled down the embankment. So there should have definitely been some dew or condensation on the box if it had traveled down that embankment. According to him, where the box had rolled down the embankment and traveled, there was no dew or condensation that morning. And something else that came into play that corroborated that time frame was the autopsy report. The medical examiners reported that there were live or moving sperm cells on Etna's body at the time of the autopsy. Sperm stays multiple in a deceased person's body for only 24 hours. But Donald had an alibi for all day Saturday and Saturday night. So, plot twist. After six years of being in prison, Donald Ruby was granted a new trial. And not only that, Donald had gotten a whole new defense team. And this new defense team had some surprising evidence. So at this point, DNA testing had just come out. New DNA testing of the semen found on Edna Posey's body revealed a shocking piece of information about her last night. New DNA testing of the semen revealed three different men that had been with Edna that night. And you guys are about to be mind fucked. You're about to be mind fucked. You're gonna be mind blown. None of the DNA matched Donald Ruby's. I'm having like a moment right now, right here. Like, 
You gotta be kidding. If he didn't do it, he spent six years in a prison and I mean, but although he probably should have gone to prison anyway because he was doing nasty little things to um, a little boy, so he probably should go to prison anyway, so it doesn't really matter. So at Donald's second trial, he stuck to his original story and his original defense, which was he and his wife had dropped Edna off downtown to go shopping. So they just kept insinuating and pushing that someone that Edna had been picked up by that day, one of those guys, had to have committed this murder and not Donald Ruby. Also, the defense called Edna's son, Randy, to testify in the second trial. Randy originally stated in the first trial that he had heard a loud thump Friday night coming from the bedroom where his mother was staying. Fast forward eight years later and it's the second trial. Randy is now 21 years old and he's saying that he actually don't remember anything like that, that he never heard a loud thump on Friday or anything about that. In addition to that, the defense was now saying that the hole found in the cardboard box could have been made by any vehicle with the same latch that was found in Donald Ruby's car. After nine days and six hours of deliberation, the jury found Donald Ruby not guilty. As you can imagine, a lot of people were baffled. Edna's friends and family was so heartbroken and just, they were shocked. They were in utter shock and completely heartbroken. Like, how could this guy get off like that? Some say that Donald Ruby is the killer and he got off easy and that he should at least still be punished for um, abusing Randy. Um, others believe that while Donald may have abused Randy, that he did not murder Edna. While this case has been closed, in the minds of the victim's family and people that were involved in this case, it remains open to them and they really do believe that Donald Ruby was the actual murderer. Sadly, you guys, that is where this case ends. Um, it has been closed and Donald Ruby was set free and is a free man. What do you guys think about this case? Do you believe that Donald Ruby is guilty of a murder or do you think he's just a child predator who accidentally got this murder charge put on him and has been set free? What do you guys think? Please let me know in the comments down below. This case is a crazy one. It blows my mind. Honestly, I'm still thinking about it. Um, I don't really know what side I'm leaning towards except for the side that he should definitely be in prison for life either way. Let me know in the comments down below what you guys thought about this case and my makeup look. I'll see you guys next week with another Forensic Friday episode. Bye!